Welcome to Biltmore Church Online. My name is Reese and this is Jenny. Uh, we are a part of our amazing kids team here at Biltmore and we're so excited um, that you're joining us virtually today. So however you may have gotten here, we're so glad that you're here. If this is your first time watching online, we would love to send you a gift. You can text the word WELCOME to 28282 and we will get that to you and we would just love to know how we can serve you. Yeah, so families, we have a couple of awesome things that we want you to know about. The first thing is this past week, we launched the very first episode of our brand new Built More Kids podcast. Uh, each week on Mondays, we'll be releasing an eight to 10 minute podcast episode where we'll recap what we learned on Sunday. We'll have a family discipleship activity for you, and we'll even have a question of the week. So whether you listen to podcasts on Spotify or Apple Music, Join us uh, this coming Monday as our next episode comes out. You know, as a kids ministry, it's a goal for us to partner with families in discipleship. And there are many ways that you can get your family involved in what we're doing here at Biltmore Church. You can visit BiltmoreChurch.com slash kids to see all of the upcoming events and opportunities and even find resources to help you as you disciple your kids to know and love Jesus. And this summer, we have something very exciting coming up called Adventure Week. It's for our rising kindergarten through fifth graders. Just three full days of awesome fun learning about who Jesus is and how they can grow in their relationship with him. There's six opportunities for your child to attend Adventure Week and you can find out everything about that by visiting BiltmoreChurch.com slash adventure. Yeah, it's going to be a couple weeks. You definitely don't want your kids to miss. Hey, we're going to continue worshiping today. Last week, Pastor Bruce led us through our brand new series called One at a Time. We're going to continue on in that series today, and we'll begin worship here in just a few minutes. Good morning, church. What a joy it is that we get to worship in the house of the Lord together this morning. Luke 130 says, 137 says, for nothing is impossible with our God. Come on, let's declare that as we sing. Come on, just one word. Just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can move. 
Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven, yeah. Just one touch. We're open to see why I can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can move Oh, praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can do There's nothing that our God can do There's not a prison wall He can break the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can do Come on, let's sing I Will Believe I will believe For greater things There's no power like the power of Jesus so let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of No power like the power of Jesus to let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like His power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing. There's nothing. Welcome to Biltmore Church. My name is Brooke, and we are so excited to be together today in this house. If this is your first time joining us online, or maybe you're in the room for the very first time, welcome. Welcome to this family. We're so excited just to, to meet together, to see you face to face, to connect with you online. And we want to do that by uh, this one thing that we need your help with. So please, if you are new here for the very first time, would you pull out your phones and would you text welcome? To 28282. That lets us know how we can serve you best and also how we can give you your next steps. And if you are a guest here in person, meet us after service in guest services. And a pastor would love just to shake hands with you and give you a gift. Also, for those who are new here in the room for the very first time, we ask nothing from you, but for those who call Biltmore Church home and would like to partner with us through your giving, you can do that through one of two different ways. You could text give to 28282, or you can drop your offerings in the boxes as you leave here today. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Ginny Taylor, our kids director. Good 
Good morning, church. As you can see, we have some dear families with us today who are committing to raising the next generation for the Lord. This past Thursday, we had the opportunity to meet with them and talk about what their role as parents is, and also our role as the church to come alongside them and teach them and to love them as they raise up their children to know and to love Jesus. And the goal of today is to commission these parents as the primary disciple makers in their home as we, the church, come alongside them. So let me introduce them to you today. We have the Apple family, the Austin family, the Badger family, the Buckle family, the Curtis family, and the Fisher family. Yeah. Praise God. Hey, I want to read a passage of scripture and then we're going to pray over them. This is what Psalm 145 says. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall command his works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. And so just as a simple act, we want to pray a prayer blessing over them. Let's pray together. God, you are great. And as your people, we want to be obedient to tell each generation of your goodness and your greatness. As we commission these families, we ask for your continued blessing on them. Would you encourage these parents as they become the primary disciple makers in their child's life? Bless their homes, their marriages. Redeem their coming and going when they rise up and lie down in everyday moments for your glory. We join them in praying for the salvation for each boy and girl and desire to see them grow to love you. Help them to come to know, believe, and share your gospel and help us as a church as we partner, equip them along the way. Thank you for being our good shepherd. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Hey, can we put our hands together one more time? We love you guys. Hey, as they're transitioning off church, stand back up to your feet. We're going to keep singing today. The next song that we're going to sing, it's called Good Plans. Um, this is just a song that stirs in our hearts to remember the promise of God, that we will see his goodness no matter what we're seeing right now. Psalm 23, verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So no matter what circumstance you walked in here with, what life looks like today, the promise that we have is that we will see the goodness and the faithfulness of our God. So come on, let's fill our hearts with faith. Let's sing this together as a church. Come on, sing it with us. The Lord is my shepherd. And he is everything I need I will not worry I will not fear the enemy He said that he loves me He said that he's with me even though I walk through the valley Of shadow and death And still I know he has good plans he has good plans for me So I will take heart in deserts and gardens He has good plans He has good plans for me If I know my Father, I know my Father has good plans we're resting on her faithfulness today. So the Lord's my Savior. The Lord is my Savior. So why should I doubt my victory? Why would I question the rod and the staff that comforts me? It quiets the waters. It quiets the storm. Could be better than walking with him when I believe he has good plans, he has good plans for me. So I will take heart in deserts and cars. He has good plans, he has good plans. 
Can be contained in our God. 
dawn I will see your face Bright as the sun We'll bow before The King of Kings Oh God Forever we will sing Oh we sing your praise Behold the Lamb The story of redemption Written on His hands On Jesus you will reign forevermore The victory is yours the sacrifice that you made on behalf of our sins. Jesus, your blood that atoned for my sins, thank you for that sacrifice, that love. Jesus, what an unconditional and rare love it is, but it's so relentless. And God, we can't help but thank you for your son Jesus today. We can't help but fill our hearts with gratitude for all that you are doing in our lives. God, we look to you today. And I ask that, Lord, if our hearts aren't filled with gratitude right now, that in the name of Jesus, we would begin to stir up a spirit of gratitude and thankfulness for who you are, for the good shepherd and good father that you are. You love us so much. Help us see that today. God, we look to you and we look to your word. We trust your word. And I pray that we cling to it this week. We love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Jesus often spoke to large crowds. So often, he would choose to focus on the one he deliberately redirected his attention from the masses to the individual. Whether it was conversing with Zacchaeus, comforting the woman at the well, or healing the blind man. These intentional encounters left people changed and began a rippling effect on the community around them. That's the way Jesus sees you. Your fears, your wounds, your hopes. And he wants us to see others in the same way, one at a time. All right, church, you're looking good. Take your Bible or your Bible app. Go to Matthew chapter three. We're going to be in there in just a few minutes. If you have your uh, scripture journal, your one at a time scripture journal, you can turn to page number six. We will be uh, we will be in there shortly. Let me do a couple of things. Uh, if you're watching online or if you're in another campus, hope you have already had a great morning of 
worship. And wherever you are, we've got a deal coming up at all the different campuses called Starting Point. And whether you've been here a year, a week, five years, whatever, is Starting Point is a place for you to kind of find out where we are, where we're going, uh, what we believe, how to plug in, if this is a great fit for you. I mean, church is kind of God's answer to a greenhouse for you to flourish in. And so it's super important. And you can either uh, text the word starting or start to 28282. You'll get a bounce back. You can register that way. You can register in the lobby. You can register online. But it's coming up in uh, either this next Sunday. I think if you're here at Arden, Arden is a week from Wednesday. But either way, a uh, great time to get your questions answered, have some good uh, barbecue as well. Uh, but anyway, take start 28282. As you, uh, hopefully as you know, unless it's your first time here, we're in two things. We're in a, a year emphasis called the year of one, the year of one. When you came in, you saw names on the walls. Those were people's ones, the one person that they love desperately. They also want to come into a love relationship, a personal relationship with, with Jesus Christ. And so what we're doing is when those names are on the wall, they help us to pray. They help us to, to believe that, you know what, God is at work in their lives. Some of them you'll start to see being circled. Those are people we've actually already seen uh, come to faith in Christ. And if you uh, are here and you haven't put Put your one on the wall, then go ahead and do that before you leave uh, today. Just first names only. We'd be, gr- be glad to pray for, pray for him, pray for her. We're in a series called uh, One at a Time. And what we're looking at is the way that Jesus, even though he might have a crowd, he was dealing with the one. And so he had that unbelievable ability to not just talk to the crowd, but then he would focus his attention on the one. So the question today is really, I mean, what kind of person as his apprentices, as his disciples, what kind of person does God want to use? And here's what I want to do. I want to read you some, this is a quick flyby because uh, each week when we have our staff meeting, we spend about the first 15 to 20 minutes talking about stories of God at work. And what they are, they're stories from all different locations talking about, this is what I saw God do. And God reconciled a marriage over here and God broke an addiction over here and God saved a family over here, all sorts of stuff. And then just this week, I've got this, this little list that came from this last, actually, staff meeting. There's a person over at West, and actually the mom goes here, and somebody saw her crying in the lobby, and she was crying in the lobby here because she found out her son over at the West Asheville campus led his one to Christ and the joy that it actually brought mom's heart to see her son lead his one to Christ. There's another, there's a, there's a young guy that is on our staff team as well. He uh, was praying for his one. His one attended two Sundays ago. Surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Our staff guy followed up with him, had lunch with him, uh, and then they had this little bracelet right here. These bracelets on the first day of the year or the first Sunday of the year, we gave these out. We do still have some of these available if you want them, but different colors, different sizes, but all they say on the, on the bracelet, it just says one. And it's a reminder. Again, anytime I see it, it's a reminder to pray for my one. Or it is a fact, it actually can be a discussion starter, but it's interesting. The guy led his one to Christ. He does a follow-up luncheon. The guy's like, hey, what is that bracelet all about? He tells him what it's about. And then he's like, hey, can I have one of those? And our guy that led the guy to Christ took off one of his bracelets, gave it to this brand new believer. I want you to just notice, this guy's been a believer like five minutes, and he's already understood. I've been rescued. I'm now on the rescue team. I was somebody else's one. Now I need to have my one that I'm going to pray for and share Christ with. There's a lady uh, in an online connect group from Ohio. This couple has already booked an Airbnb for the weekend of outdoor baptism. And so they're going to be coming down from Ohio in September to be baptized. You got uh, another person put uh, this person's name on the wall. And I think this was her son. The son saw his name on the wall. And when he saw his name on the wall, it moved him. God used it. And actually there at the wall, he prayed to receive Christ. And then another one, again, I got a whole list of them here. This is actually a middle school student who was at her FCA uh, meeting. And as she was at the FCA, FCA meeting, she noticed there was a one there, one, the one that people were praying for. And then there at the FCA meeting outside the walls of this church, he gave his life to Christ and then he was actually baptized last Sunday. So tons of good stories. And here's what I want you to, here's what I want you to recognize. What I want you to recognize about all of those stories and probably 99% of all the stories we hear, all the baptisms you get to see, 99% of those are not done in isolation. They're not done in a vacuum. When you peel back the layer, what you see about 99% of the time is God using, you know, a sibling, a friend, a classmate, a teammate, uh, somebody in the neighborhood that they knew 
God was using somebody, not a perfect person, maybe even a pretty new believer, but God was already using somebody in that whole story and using them in a significant way. And as I thought about that, we're going to look at a guy today that in some ways, even though he's like super odd, he is also a pattern for the kind of person that God uses. That's always what he does. He looks and he takes an ordinary person, ordinary people, and they play significant roles in his story. Now, when you look at it, oftentimes he takes the slowest. He's not like when we divvy up teams and like, hey, we're going to play kickball, let's divvy up teams. No, he always takes the shortest. He takes the slowest. He also takes the poorest. He takes oftentimes the ones with the least amount of ability and then does God-sized stuff with them. And so today when we're asking the question, all right, what about, what about can God use me? Because there's something in the DNA of the believer. When you come into the family of God through repentance and faith in Jesus, there is that built-in part. It's like there's, I, God wants to somehow, some way, it's got to be about more than just getting up and going to work and earning a living and coming home and watching the masters and then going to bed and doing the same thing again. There's got to be something more. And what it is is God wants to use you in his story. It doesn't mean that God uses perfect people because there's only one perfect person and we put him on a tree. But the idea is all the different people God used, most of the time, they did not have all their stuff together. I mean, you just go down the list of the people God used. Noah was a drunk. Jacob was a liar. Joseph was a convict. Moses was a murderer. Elijah got fearful. Jonah was a rebel. You know, and, and, and Peter was a hypocrite. Now, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. God is the sovereign king. He uses who he wants, when he wants, how he wants. But there is a pattern. There is a pattern in which you see that God either identifies in a person or usually builds into that person and saying, you know what? These are some characteristics of the type of people, type of person that I use. And so the guy that we're looking at today is a strange character, but he is he is front and center in preparing the way for the public ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus actually says of John the Baptist, he says, there is nobody greater that has been born of a woman than this guy. In other words, this guy is the goat. Nobody in the Bible, obviously other than Jesus, this guy stands right at the top and God used him in a remarkable way. What I want you to think of is, can God, am I in a position, am I aligned, is my life in the right direction, trajectory, where God can actually and wants to use me. So I'm gonna walk through this. Let me tell you what I'm gonna do. We're gonna walk through this passage and when we go through it, we're mainly looking at characteristics of the people God uses. But secondarily, you're gonna see some other things. You're gonna see some things like, what's the deal with baptism? I'm, I'm kinda new to church and I don't know when I should be baptized. You're gonna see that in the text. You might be here and you have some doubts and some questions and you're like, man, I'm not sure. Can I be a disciple if I have some doubts? I'm like, I got some big doubts. So what you're going to see today, actually, if you have some doubts, you might make a wonderful disciple because even this guy had some doubts. And just so you know, if you're new here, what we do 99% of the time, and we do it mostly today, is we'll take a text and we'll go right through it line by line, verse by verse. And I'm going to do kind of like a little Quentin Tarantino flashback about halfway through this sermon. As we walk through it, I'm going to do a quick flash forward and then flash back because I want to show you, I want to show you as big and tough and strong and godly and confident as John the Baptist is, believe it or not, he even had moments of doubt, just like if you walk with the Lord for any length of time, you will as well. So here's where we are. Matthew chapter three, starting verse one, in those days. John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Here's what his message is. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. And when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So let me give you a few characteristics of the people God uses. Number one is they have confidence in the word of God. They have confidence in God's word. The very first phrase says, in those days. In what days? It, understand, there had been 400 years where God had not spoken. No prophet, no revelation, no new voice from God. When you close the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, when that book closes, God's mouth also closes, and God doesn't speak for 400 years. Theologians call it the silent years. And actually, it's more like 460 years, but for 400 plus years, no prophet, no revelation, no word from God. Israel, when he closes up the Old Testament, was in deep sin. 
no repentance. God was begging them to repent. And then it goes 400 years and Israel is still in the same place. And yet God chooses to speak. And the guy he's going to use to speak through is a guy named John the Baptist. Now, real quickly, if you're new to church, or maybe if you're like really, really old to church, you might think, John the Baptist, okay, that's because he was Baptist, all right? I'm Baptist, and, and there, it's, listen, it's not that. It's not John the Baptist like, you know, Pete the Presbyterian or Mike the Methodist. That's not what he said. It's really John the Baptizer. That's what he did, and you'll see it right here. He is the one, he's baptizing people when they repent. So when you look at this, his message is, his whole message is pretty easy. And it's this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So it's kind of a two-part sermon. So right off the bat, he's like, repent. He's like, that's all you say. That's all you say. You all say repent. 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 We think of repentance. We think of repentance as kind of a bad thing, kind of like a spanking. But repentance is the message of the Old Testament. It's also the message that Jesus Christ himself said right off the bat. He's like, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. The word repentance simply means a change of mind. It means it's not a change of church, it's not a change of marriage, it's not a change of address, it is a change of mind. It means I'm looking at my sin and my circumstances and even who God is, and I'm looking and I'm changing my mind about it, and I'm beginning to look at it from God's perspective. And so if you were listening to John the Baptist preach, and he were to go on about repentance for like an hour, and you're like, hey, uh, I'm kind of tired of the, I mean, point one, we got it, repent. What's point two? He's like, repent, that's point two as well. Until you do point one, we're not gonna go on to point two. And in some ways, that was a message to Israel because they had yet to repent, but also it's a message you and I have to ask every day. Is there any area of my life that is not surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus? Is there any area of my life I need to change my mind on? It could be about relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, could be about sex, could be about money, could be about business, business ethics, could be about as simple as baptism. Is there some area that I need to get on God's side and get Jesus' best? That's what he's saying. And he's saying the kingdom of heaven is near. He's referencing the fact that Jesus is about to start his public ministry and the kingdom of God is starting to break in and then Jesus is gonna have three and a half years of ministry. He's gonna be crucified. He's gonna be put in a tomb. He's gonna be resurrected. Then he's gonna send into heaven and then one day the Bible says he's coming back and he's going to set up the kingdom of heaven for now and forever. So all that being said, Matthew quotes Isaiah 40, it's like, and John the Baptist quotes it when people ask him, who is he? John the Baptist is like, listen, I'm not the Messiah. I'm the guy trying to open up the door so he can walk through. Verse four says this. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. So check what's going on. They're tr Matthew's trying to paint a picture of a contrast between John the Baptist and the religious elite of that day. All right, it's like John the Baptist, he wore like, don't think camel hair coat that you're gonna go get like a Joseph A. Bank, all right? Think about, it's like camel, it's like rough, coarse hair, all right? He's got this belt, he's kind of wild looking, he's got a beard, it says he's eating locusts, locusts and honey. I mean, weirdest thing I've ever eaten is guinea pig when we were on a mission trip in Ecuador and they didn't even tell us did somebody just, oh, no, 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 it's, it's a gift, but we're in Ecuador, okay? They're like, here it is. They didn't tell us, they didn't tell us till after we ate it, all right? You're like, what it tastes like? Chicken, that's what it tastes like. Just like everything else you don't know, it tastes like chicken. But he's over there, and he's eating locusts and honey, but here's the point. He's like, this guy is not like all the religious elite. Jesus is actually going to say, what did you go out to see? Did you go out to see some super polished guy? No, we didn't go out to see that. He said, like, that's not who John the Baptist is. The religious elite were like the guys that were like super soft and they wore Snuggies and they drove like Mini Coopers and like, that's not John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist is like big, bearded, drove a truck. I mean, that's who, that's who John the Baptist is. And his platform was like just exploding. It says that all the people were going out to him. Scholars say there could be potentially up to six figures of people going, that's 100,000 people going out to see John the Baptist. So in our world, what it would be is like, this guy is the one every conference wants to come speak. This is the one that every company's saying, would you come write a book? It's this guy that all the magazines want to write up on, and this is what is going on with John the Baptist, and keep that in mind. So, and they were baptized by him in the River Jordan, confessing their sins. Again, this guy is not shy 
This guy is strong. He is bold. Because when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, again, think religious elite, think denominational leaders, Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Okay, That is not like what they teach you in how to win friends and influence people. They're like, you're a bunch of snakes and a bunch of Jewish leaders would have not just thought, oh, you're calling me a copperhead. That's not really what they're thinking. They're thinking you are like the enemy back in Genesis chapter three that plunged the whole world into sin. That's what they're thinking. They're like, you're like your father, the devil. That's what they're catching. You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, so what's the... John the Baptist steps out and he says, repent for the kingdom of God is coming. In other words, you change your mind because Jesus is about to come on the scene and if you don't switch sides, you're gonna be on the wrong side of God when this whole thing comes down in just a few minutes. And what's interesting is the Jews would use baptism when a Gentile wanted to convert to Judaism. So baptism wasn't brand new with Jesus and John the Baptist. They used it before. The Jews would use it if a Gentile, think non-Jew, if a non-Jew wanted to become a Jew, one of the last things that he would do is he would end up being baptized. And when he got baptized, like, okay, you are a, you are a Jew. And what he's saying, what he's saying is, what he's saying is, listen, it's both for the religious and the rebellious. It's for the religious and the rebellious. So he's looking at these religious people and he's like, you know what? Your religion can separate you from God, just like your rebellion. So this is something we talk about all the time here. Understand when it comes to you being separated from God, there's two ways that you can be separated from God. One is rebellion. Rebellion says, I do what I want with whom I want, whenever I want, as long as I want, I got this God, get out of my life. That's rebellion. You and I recognize that pretty easy. What you and I have to also realize is not just can rebellion separates you from God, but our religion can separate you from God. Because religion says, I got this. I'm going to do all these things so, God, you then owe me. I'm going to put up all these resumes. I'm going to be a good little boy. I'm going to go to Mecca. I'm going to align my chakra. I'm going to do whatever that is so that at the end of it, I will have this resume and I don't need grace. So he says, you got to repent. He says, you've got to repent. So let me talk to you about baptism a second. Because I know baptism brings a lot of emotion because it's a lot of family history and it's a lot of, a lot of stuff. So let me give you a couple thoughts about baptism you see from the text. Number one is your baptism, your baptism announces your repentance. Your baptism, just like what you saw here, and I think we saw four or five in the first service, your baptism, whether you know what's going on or not, you are going public with who you are identifying with. When a person is baptized as a believer, what they are expressing and they're identifying is I am identifying with the person and the work of Jesus. I'm now on team Jesus. Now being baptized doesn't put you on team Jesus. It just professes that you are on team Jesus. And what you see in the Bible, there is a pattern. A person has an inward change. God does something on the inside. The Bible says, you know what? He takes out your stone heart and he gives you a heart of flesh. He gives you a new future. He gives you the Holy Spirit. He saves you. The Bible says saves. The Bible says born again. John chapter one says as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be children of God. That whole idea of repentance and belief are like two sides of the same coin. I'm changing my mind about Jesus, about the fact that I can make my whole life work and I'm turning over to Jesus and Jesus alone. That's repentance and faith. And when you look in the Bible, here's what you see, and this is throughout the Bible. I'm going to give you a quick flyby. Here is what the book of Acts, which is the first 30 years of the early church. Here's how people get baptized every single time in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, 3,000 people, quote, receive Peter's word and they're baptized. Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch says, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. Acts chapter 9, Paul believes, then he's baptized. Acts 10 says the Holy Spirit fell on all who believed the word and then they were baptized. Acts chapter 16 says Lydia's heart was, quote, open to pay attention to what Paul had said, which was the gospel, and then they were baptized. 
Acts chapter 16, verse 30, the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And he believed, and then Paul baptized him and everybody else in his family who believed. Acts chapter 18 says, many Corinthians listened to Paul's teaching and preaching and believed, and then they were, then they were baptized. You're like, what's the big deal? It sounds like a ritual. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of a church deal where you guys like have this ritual. Why is it so important if I'm an apprentice or if I'm a follower of Jesus? Why is it so important that I do that? You gotta be care- you gotta, you gotta realize that whatever Jesus says is important, we dare not say it's not important. What he says is of little importance, then we can put on the lower shelf. What he says is of top importance, he even exam- he gives give us an example that he gets baptized. He gets baptized in a few verses, not as a baptism of repentance. He didn't have anything to be repenting of. He's sinless. But he's being baptized to identify with John's ministry, that this is the guy that opens up the door. This is the guy that Isaiah talked about. And then also it's an example for you and I as a step of obedience of followers down through time. It's like, this is what I want you to do as your public profession. Now, you might have grown up. You might have grown up. If you grew up in a church and a preacher told you that your public profession was raising your hand, that's not, that's not in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with it. I've had you do it before. Nothing wrong with raising your hand. That's just not the New Testament profession of faith. Sometimes people have you walk an aisle, come down here, talk to a preacher, and then, okay, you got to get led to Christ right down here on the front row, somewhere between the stanzas of verse two and then verse four. And people are like, if you don't walk an aisle, that's your public profession. They didn't even have aisles in the early church, folks. The New Testament public profession in the book of Acts throughout the whole teaching is your baptism is you actually, and the word baptism is not even translated, it's transliterated. It's, it's baptizo, which means to dunk or to dip or to submerge. That's why we do it the way we do it. And every time in Acts, what happens is somebody is converted internally and then shows that externally, kind of puts a line in the sand and said, that's it. And what's interesting is, we're gonna see this a little bit more next week, but Jesus gets baptized, he comes up out of the water and then he hears the voice of his father affirming him as this, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And almost, and then he sees the, it says the spirit like a dove came and descended on him. And then he immediately goes out to be tempted. And throughout the temptation, what you will see is the attacks are on his identity. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, do this. And what was kind of the, one of the anchors that Jesus could look at and not and, and always resist temptation is you know what look what the father said over me martin luther who was actually the head of the protestant reformation not the head but he was sort of like the person god used to get back to the bible way back in like the 1600s or so it said when he would put his head down on his pillow and he said when the enemy would come and torment me what i would tell him what i would tell him is listen i came to christ and i was baptized you are no longer the master over me You're no longer the master. It was like that anchor point. It was that line in the sand. And here's what I want to ask you. If you are a believer in Jesus, have you ever been baptized? Have you ever publicly been baptized? You're like, well, I got baptized as a baby. Now, I know that's emotional because I got baptized as a six-month-old, had a nice little white nightgown. I I was looking cute. I mean, I really did. And and here's what you got to remember. There are no verses in the Bible about infant baptism, and there's no verses in the Bible about somebody being baptized before they came to Christ. When it comes to the family, think about it this way. So when my mom and dad had me christened at six months old, and then years later, when I actually came to faith in Christ, you know, that first thing, me being christened, that was their decision, and I'm happy for it. Then when I was 17, that was my decision. And so it's not a denigration of what they said. It's actually a ratification, an affirmation that what they actually wanted to happen, they wanted me to be a follower of Christ as best they knew. Well, then guess what? Now my decision, my personal decision, that's ratifying what they said. So far from being something they put down, it's, it's actually affirming what they did. So here, here would be my question before we go on to the next one. Have you been baptized as a believer? As a believer, have you been baptized? If you haven't, you're like, what's my next step of obedience? What's my first next step of obedience? We talked about last week. It's like, if I'm following Jesus, I always am gonna have a step to take. And if you've not been baptized after you actually came to faith in Christ, then that is a next step. That is the next step. As a matter of fact, here's what I would challenge you. I would say that some of you actually know that already and you've kind of 
you kind of done it, you kind of put it to the side for whatever reason, and then if you're not careful, you're going to walk off campus today and put it on there. And I would say that the more God tells you and I to do anything and that we don't do it, then the heart gets a little bit harder every single time and his voice gets a little bit fainter each time as well. It's actually called quenching the spirit. God tells you to do something, you don't do it, it quenches the spirit and little by little by little by little, you're gonna stop hearing that voice. My challenge to you, before you leave, before you leave today, if that's you, man, just go by that baptism. There's a whole big deal, next steps. It's got a big television, it says baptism. Just say, hey, I got some questions. They'd answer the questions for you. You're like, hey, I need to follow through on baptism. They'll get you scheduled. Heck, some of you actually are like, you know what? I don't wanna leave this campus until I actually am in the water. You know what? I'll just bet you, if you tell a pastor that in the lobby, we'll come in here after everybody's gone and we'll put you under the water. If you do that and you make them stay late, they'll probably keep you under the water a little extra. But I'm just saying, don't leave, don't leave disobedient. That's a terrible way to leave church. It's a terrible way to leave church thinking, you know what, I'm walking out of God's house knowing that I'm not following him. That's a, that's a, that's a bad deal. So here's the way the story keeps going. And I want to, here's what I want to do. You, you want to have confidence in God's word, but as I said earlier, I'm going to do a little flash forward and then flash back. You don't have to turn there, but it is just like five or six chapters ahead. The reason I want to show you this is because if we're not careful, we look at guys like John the Baptist and we look at maybe some people you admire that are really strong and really bold and really courageous and always step out for God and they never seem afraid and they never seem like they lack faith and they always are so strong and they believe in God. What I want you to show, what I want to show you is, listen, even guys like John the Baptist at times have questions. Even guys like John the Baptist have doubt. And so, Flash forward to Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to go, we'll finish up in Matthew 3. But Matthew chapter 11, here's the, way it, here's the way it says, just a few verses. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, we don't know how long this is, let's, let's just say about a year later. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples, he still got some, and said to him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? People God uses, the people God use, they're honest with their doubts. Some of you are like, is this the same John? Because I told you last week there's like nine Johns in the New Testament. Is this the same John the Baptist who was like calling the denominational leaders a bunch of snakes? And he's like, you need to repent right here. Is that this guy asking if he's the one? Think about it. We don't know exactly how, because John is in prison, by the way, not for doing something wrong, but for doing something right. He actually was super bold in his preaching and called on this political leader, said, you know what, you are in sin. And so he gets put in jail, and we don't know how long. It seems like he's been there a long time. And all that goes in that, so he's probably physically tormented, he's probably emotionally struggling, He's been isolated for a long, long, long time, and he just wants some clarification. It's almost like he's saying this. Listen, if you are the one, I don't mind dying for you, but I just want to make sure you are the one, because if you're not the one, if there's somebody else coming and I made a mistake, if I made a mistake, I'd rather not be beheaded. And so he sends the messengers off. And before I tell you what they actually say, you ever find yourself in that place? Come on, this is, I know it's not a place to be honest in church, but I mean, have you ever, you ever find yourself in that place? That place when God's not actually responding the way you prayed and hoped and believed that God would respond? I mean, have you ever like prayed your face off thinking God's gonna do a miracle right here and all of a sudden the miracle doesn't happen? I mean, it can run the gamut. I mean, there's probably 10 different scenarios just in this room where well, you're struggling. It's like, you know what? I believed for that. I prayed for that. My friends prayed for that. My connect group believed for that. And God isn't acting like you thought God would act. I mean, think about it. I mean, let's go through a few pictures. I mean, some of you, you might be in here and maybe you, I mean, you, you did your part of the vows. I mean, you did your part of the vows. You did for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health till death do his part. You did those. You did those. And they didn't do, they didn't do theirs. And they betrayed you and they rejected you. I mean, and what's worse, you've been going to church here for a little while and you've been inviting them and you wrote their name on the wall. And man, and they're showing no, like no interest. They're just laughing and having a big time out there, have no interest. And on top of that, they got a better attorney than you and they're taking so much of your money. You're like, God, what's the deal? 
I'm the one that was faithful. I'm the one that believed. I'm the one going to church. I'm the one praying for him to be saved. And yet he's the one out having a big time and I'm the one about to lose my kids. Or how about you got an addiction? You got an addiction and you hate what it does to you. You hate what it does to your family. You pray that God would take it away. You pray that God would like one, two, three, zap, and you would be good. You prayed for that to happen, and it had to happen. And you're like, God, where are you? I thought you were going to do this. I see it in the Bible. I see it in the book of Acts. Why won't you do it with me? Some of you got some financial issues, and it wasn't even because you spent more than you earned. It's because you had a business partner that ripped you off, or you had an investment advisor, and they took your retirement savings. And now you're sitting there and you got no retirement. You're having to work at 76 years of age. I mean, that ticks you off. And it makes you mad. And you've been faithful and you've tithed and you've done all that stuff. And that joker's getting off scot-free. And you're like, God, where are you? I read all this stuff and I see all these stories, but where are you? And I know there's some parents and grandparents in here. And where this starts to hit home is, what about that prodigal? I mean, you look, you look at their life and you're like, man, is this, is this my fault? I mean, did we do something wrong? I mean, we took him to VBS and we took him to student camp and we did the best we could. But you're like, man, did, did my sin, did my sin somehow, did my sin somehow cause this? You're sitting there and you're, you're infertile. And you and your spouse, you're trying to have a baby and you, you don't have to look at, you don't have to look 10 minutes out in the culture and you see all these people who are getting pregnant like they just hold hands and they get pregnant and they don't even want the baby and you're dying to just be a godly mom. You're dying to just be a godly dad. And, all of it, and it's just not happening. And you're like, God, what happened? I mean, we're the ones that actually want the baby. Or how about uh, some of you lost a loved one. You prayed and 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 you prayed. God, please, please come in here. Come on now. I know you can. I know you can. Even this week, it's been interesting. You've had, we've had a, seems like an inordinate, the last couple of weeks, inordinate number of reports about different folks in the church Get, having a cancer diagnosis. And what's interesting is you've got, let's say if you had four of them, two of them have already come back like, you know what? It's a miracle. The, whole, the tumor's gone. The MRI came back. Awesome. And you're like, praise God. Rejoice. That's awesome. And two of them came back bad. And it is cancer. And not only is it cancer, it's cancer and it's gotten out of the whatever, the prostate's gotten out of the brain or whatever, it's gotten into the lymph system or it's gotten into your body and you're gonna have to do some serious, serious, serious medicine. At best, some serious medicine. You're like, God, what happened? What happened, what happened to that? I like the stories on the screen. I just kind of occasionally, occasionally want, occasionally want one for my life. And there's not anybody in here probably that doesn't know somebody that they saw get in a situation like that. And when that happened, they're just like, forget it. And, you, and they walked away from the Lord. They walked away. And here's what you got to remember. And sometime you've seen it, and sometime that journey's still going on. Because maybe you are one. And you walked away from the Lord, and, you're like, and you just went, and it's like, man, the world's going to have a better answer for this question than the Lord appears to be showing me. And what happens is, you know what? You go out and you look for that in the world, and you never find it in the world. And then sometimes you see them come back, and bless God, they come back. But you know what? They come back with more scars and more pain and more hurt. You know why? Because the enemy doesn't care. The enemy hates you. Think the enemy's going to try to bolster you and encourage you and feed your faith? No, he's trying to destroy you. And what you see in, in this story is, and I don't, I don't know how to, I mean, the way Jesus deals with him and deals with us is so gentle and yet it's real. So let me read you two verses. And it says, and Jesus answered them. Again, the disciples go, tell us if you're the one. He, he does two things. He says, go and tell John what you hear and see. What you hear, stuff Jesus is saying. What you see, stuff Jesus is doing. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have the good news preached to them. You know what he's quoting? He's quoting Isaiah 40, or he's quoting actually a little bit of a mix match of, of Isaiah. You know what you might not notice at first glance? Because what he says is, he goes, the good news is I am the Messiah. The good news is, look at all this evidence. Nobody else raises the dead. Nobody else gives sight to the blind. Nobody else makes the deaf hear. Nobody can do that. Good news, John. I am the one you've been waiting for. You were not mistaken on the front end. But what you might miss is the fact that what he doesn't put in the quote from Isaiah is in Isaiah that actually says, and the prisoners will be set free. In other words, John... I am the one you've been looking for. I am the sovereign king of the universe. 
I'm the one that you paved a way for. And I love you, but you're going to die in prison. You're going to die in prison. What we have to keep in mind when we see all this, the gospel is not, the Bible does not teach, follow Jesus and he will make your life better. The gospel is you follow Jesus because he is actually better than life. Now, sometimes, I would say most of the time, you follow Jesus and our life does get better, right? When you follow Jesus, faithfulness usually works out a lot better than adultery. Community works a lot, a lot better than loneliness. But the promise is not follow Jesus and you will get cotton candy and Cadillacs. That is not the promise. That's actually the prosperity gospel, which is no gospel at all. Prosperity gospel is, you know what? God is, you put a nickel in, pull the slot machine, and then God owes you. That's not the gospel. What the gospel says is you die to yourself every single day. You might not get the cotton candy and Cadillacs. You might get the cancer, but guess what? You get God in the midst of it. That's what the gospel is. And so he's saying, John, I love you. Uh, and again, here's the, you're like, well, how do I know God even loves me? I mean, the skewbill line I'm going through right now, I mean, that, uh, the hell on earth that my life seems to be right now, and it's gotten worse, and maybe you're a new believer, and you're like, man, I've been a believer like a year, and it's gotten worse. How do I know God even loves me? You got to hear this. The way you know God loves you is not to base it on your current circumstances. I mean, you do not base it. It's like, hey, my current circumstances are great, therefore God loves me. The way we know God loves us, let me put it for you. The way you know God loves you, the way you know God is for you, the way you know God is with you, the reason you don't have to fear is because Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says that God demonstrates his love toward you that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. If you look around at your circumstances to gauge how much God loves you, you are always going to be on a roller coaster. If it's great, God loves me. If it's bad, God hates me. You look back at a cross and say, you know what? I know God loves me. And loved one, you got to get that theology down before you go into the storm. If you're trying to make up your theology as you go into a storm and you look around and the waves are going up and the kids are crazy and the circumstances are bad and the money's going drying up and you're like, that's how much God loves me, you are going to be one defeated believer. But you can look back every time and go, I know, I know for a fact, good times are bad. God loves me because he proved it 2,000 years ago. So let me finish it out with this way. The people that, if you want to be used by God, don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. Don't be afraid to simply say, okay, I got some doubts. You know, for full confession, I mean, my doubts are different than they were when I first became a believer. But have I got some questions? I'm not going to tell you what they are, but I might still got some questions. I'm like, hey, how did this work out? Or how are you figuring out this? Or maybe it's a personal question. He's like, how come, you know, my dad died when I was a teenager? How come this happened? Or you got the, that's fine. What do you do? You just pick up your doubts and you pick up your question and you bundle them up and you bring them to Jesus and you walk and you follow Jesus one step at a time. Because he's going to use you if you have some confidence in the word, you get honest with your doubts and here's the way it ends. Look at these last few verses. Go back to that chapter three, it says this. It says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but, and I want you to notice what he does is he, going back to when he has this big platform, John has made a very conscious decision that it is not about me. It's not about me. If anything in here you can hear is like, you know what, less of me, more of God. Less of me, more of God. It's not about me. God loves me. It's just not about me. God is for me. It's just not about me. Now watch what John does. He goes overboard in doing this. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me, he is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. That just kind of means he's, I can't even carry his gym bag. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff, he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came to Galilee, to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. We talked about that earlier. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? You know what that's called? That's called understanding your place. But Jesus answered him and said, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness, thus he consented. Let me give this last one a little more quickly, but this is like the North Star of the Christian life. If you're an apprentice, this one thought is like super key. It'll make so much stuff from your marriage life 
to your work life, all that stuff, even to the way you get stuck in traffic. This will make so much sense if you can just get in your head. It's not about me. It's about God. It's not about me. It's about God. I got to know who it's all about. Over and over, he says, it's not about me. Somebody's coming mightier than me. There's a, there's a place, there's another second verse you ought to memorize in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, hey, I got some bad news. I got some, or they come to John. They got, John, I got some bad news. John Incorporated is losing market share to Jesus Incorporated. Okay, John, we've had, we've been the platform. We've had the most followers, but we're going to tell you that guy you talked about across the river, people are leaving John Incorporated and they are going over to Jesus Incorporated. We are losing. And that is when John makes the amazing statement. He must increase. I must decrease. He must increase. I must decrease. It's not about us, guys. It's about him. Our friend Louis Giglio said it this way in his little book called uh, I Am Not, But I Know the I Am. Some, something like that. <laughs> I can't remember the book title. But here, it's a great quote either way. He said, John didn't politely say he should increase or I want him to increase or even it would be nice if he did increase. It was an expression of determination, a calculated purpose statement for his life and ministry. It's as if John were saying no matter what else happens, there's one thing that has to take place. Jesus must emerge and expand in the hearts and the affections of people. He must be elevated, honored, exalted, focused on, cherished, enjoyed, amplified, and adored by all people everywhere. That's what he's saying. Do you have it down in your heart that God loves you? And you need to know that. God does love you. Do you know that? And God is actually for you. God is for you. You don't die for somebody you're not for. So God does love you and God is for you, but somewhere in your heart of hearts, you've got to settle the matter that it is not about you. Because if you just settle that one thing, you will deal with two of the primary weapons the enemy has against you. Two of the things that trip us up all the time. And that is on one hand, insecurity, and on the other hand, ego. Especially if you're a leader, and there's everybody in here is a leader of something. And what trips up the leaders are insecurity and ego. Insecurity and ego. Insecurity basically says your job is to please people. Insecurity, your job is to please people. Your job is to please people. That's insecurity. I want people to like me. I got to please people. I got to make them like me. I want to be liked by them. That is insecurity. John the Baptist didn't have any insecurity so he could look at the denomination and go, you're a bunch of snakes. Because why? Because he's like, it's, I'm nothing. God's everything. In ego. Ego. John really didn't have an ego because what ego says is it's everybody else's job to please me. Everybody else's job is to please me. And if you have a bunch of ego, that's why you're a super demanding boss. That is why you are an entitled person. That's why you crumble under pressure. Because if anything taints that perfect picture of the glorious wide world of you, then you get upset about it. That's also why oftentimes you crave the credit. You're like, I got to have the credit. I got to have the credit. That's why some people that work for you are like, why don't you give anybody else the credit? It's not about you. What John had is John knew the purpose of his life was not just his ambitions, his goals, his resume. It was about how do I make Jesus famous? The question is, do you have that? I mean, do we, we as a church, we better always keep that, all right? All right? God can, God can use somebody else. God has been super gracious to us. You understand, though? God can use somebody else. And I tell you, one of the ways he does that is if anybody begins to think, you know what? If it's not about Jesus, if it's about the music or the kids or the preacher or whatever, it's not that big a... It's not that big for God to just write Ichabod on top of a church. Ichabod just means the glory has departed. And you want to make the glory depart from a church or a family or a life? All you got to do is start soaking up the credit for what God has done. And so what we do here is this is like the North Star. If you have that as your North Star, you're going to know. If you can just like, I, I'm locating the North Star, that's going to help you know, okay, where am I? What direction should I go in? Even when your life is... If your life is good, it's still your North Star. So you know what you do? When you're getting blessed, God's giving you the raises, everything's coming up roses, and that's still your North Star. You know what you show the world, a watching world? They show, you know what, that guy, God blessed his socks off and he's still crazy in love with Jesus. 
Man, his marriage is good, his kids are good, his house is good, his health is good. He's got this awesome blessing. He won the lottery, and yet he's still crazy in love with Jesus. And if life is tough for you right now, you know what you can? You can show a watching world that, you know what, I can have peace and joy and know that God is good in spite of my circumstances. Because you know what? I don't have to look around in my circumstances and know that God is good and God loves me. I can look back 2,000 years ago when he died on a tree for me, and even then he knew what I was like, and he still loved me. So the way we respond, um, you know, if you go to church here very long, you know that we, we always, when we, we worship some, and then we get in the Word, and then we respond. And let me give you some instructions about what we're going to do. Um, you know, part of the way we respond is we do come and pray. And maybe today I made the, I, I mistakenly made it sound like your pain's not a big deal. Listen, your pain is a big deal. Your pain's a big deal. It's a big, if I could cure it, I would. Your pain's a big deal. It's a big, it's a big deal to God. The Bible says, call to me in your day of trouble. Your day of trouble. Whatever that day of trouble is, he says, call to me, call to me. And so for today, you got some pain, you got some pain point, you got some burden. And how appropriate is it just come hit your knees and say, God, I, I need your help. I need your help. And you name the area. Others of you during this response time, you might want to go to the wall and just write your one down. You're like, I don't even go to church here. That's okay. Don't take up a lot of space, but just, you know, write it small. If you don't go to church, but just write your one down there. What that'll do is that at least some people will be praying for them all the time. We also do singing at this time. We do sing. I guess the question I would ask is, you know, did you sing like a saved person when you were singing good plans? There's a song that good plans, it's not that every, good plans doesn't mean easy plans. Good plans means it's in the sovereign hand of a good God. That's what it is. It means, you know, John 10 says he's a good shepherd and that somehow he has either allowed the difficulty or has he allowed the blessing, either one, but it's, that's the reason it's good plans. That's what part of that song talks about Psalm 23, surely, surely, goodness and kindness will follow me all the days of my life. So here's what's going on. When you're singing, that's like a faith builder. Psalm says that God is the lifter of our, the lifter of our heads. You might have walked in here, a little bit of faith, and all when you sing a song like this is, he is lifting your head. Not necessarily giving you a bunch of faith, but lifting your head to the object of your faith. And it's like, God is a good shepherd. And even though it's pretty bad right now, I know that God is in control and God loves me. And you sing that and you feel your faith building. And then lastly, we do, we bring. You might have, if you're new here, you're like, y'all didn't even pick up an offering. You're pretty fired up about that. You're like, Martha, we found a new church. I mean, that's great. That's great. But the question you got to ask though, seriously, is the fact that, all right, is that one area, is generosity an area that you need to take a step of repentance and become a generous person? So here's what we're going to do. Why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to pray for us. And we got about four minutes the song does ramp a little bit, so you're going to have time to pray if you want to pray. I would simply say this. However you prayed about 40 minutes ago when we sang this song the first time, try to turn that up a little bit in intensity of like, you know what? I'm going to sing like a person who actually believes what I'm singing. So, Father, that's our prayer today. We're, you're a great shepherd, and you're a good shepherd, and we're dumb sheep so often. We're just dumb. We make dumb decisions. God, thank you for being a God of grace who forgives our dumb decisions, forgives our sin, picks us back up. God, thank you for that verse that says, a righteous man, he falls seven times and yet gets back up. God, thank you for all the people, including John the Baptist, who were far from perfect and yet the sovereign king used them in amazing ways. We want to be people that you would choose to use, build into that, build into that confidence in the word being honest with you about the concerns and even doubts that we've got, but then making sure that you would put the words in our mouth to give the credit and the glory for whatever we do and whatever we see you do. We love you. Thank you for inviting us to share our burdens, share our prayers. Thanks for the stories we get to hear. Thanks for the circles we get to see on a wall of another life that's been changed by the gospel of Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen. All right, church. Again, it's about four minutes. And so our deal is, let's make the most of these four minutes, either praying, writing, singing, giving, whatever that is. Uh, don't wait for somebody else, but you be the first one out saying, I got to go talk to God.
The Lord is my shepherd And he is everything I need I will not worry I will not fear the enemy He said that he loves me He said that he's with me Even though I walk through the valley Shadow and death and still I know He has good plans He has good plans for me So I will take heart in deserts and gardens He has good plans He has good plans for me I know my father, I know my father has good plans, yes you do, the Lord is my Savior, so why should I doubt my victory, why would I question Rod in the staff that comforts me He quiets the waters He quiets the storm inside me So what could be better Than walking with Him when I believe He has good plans He has good plans for me So I will take heart it's in He has good plans. He has good plans for me. If I know my father, I know my father has. He has good plans. He has good plans for me. Though I will take on in deserts and Hey, thanks so much for joining us today for Biltmore Church Online. As we wrap up today's services, I want to encourage you to do a couple of things. First of all, if you are listening to today's message and you made a decision for the first time to surrender to the Lordship of Christ, you made a decision to follow Jesus today. We're so excited about that, and we want to help you on your journey in the days ahead. So I want to ask you to take your phone and text the word FOLLOW to 28282, and we're going to reach out with some next steps that you can take in your journey with Jesus in the months ahead. We would love to come alongside you in that process. You can also text BAPTISM to 28282 if you want uh, to follow through and sign up to get baptized here at our church as well. I know that's something we talked about in today's message. We're going to be here same time, same place next weekend. If you live in the 828, we would love to have you join us um, at one of our campuses for in-person worship. We'll be online at 9 and 11 as well. As always, you are loved and sent. 